<laughs> so, so thank you, Lynn. That was like really uh, uh, a very nice introduction. Probably not deserved at all, but uh, anyway, th thank you for that. And uh, let me just say that I really enjoyed my uh, visit today, visiting with the faculty and seeing the students is really always great to see. Good, good to see how other people do things. And it's, it's an impressive place, and you guys should be really proud uh, that you go here. So um, today I'm going to discuss a topic that we've been working on for uh, many years, and uh, I, I'd say, well, maybe like six years or so. And um, it's, it's a topic on, on that's called, we call it flame flashback in swirl combustion, and it's related to um, essentially power generation, so gas turbines for, for power generation. And, um, and so the work has been sponsored by uh, DOE, and, uh, um, and so we're, we're, we're thankful for that and over a couple of grants, and um, the work has been done that I, I'm showing you by two really good uh, PhD students of mine, uh, Dominic Abey and uh, Rakesh uh, Ranjan. And um, so they are they're done in the sense this, this topic is, is sort of completed for the most part. And, um, and so, as I said, it's, it's relevant to gas turbines for power generation. So these are sort of aero-derived engines. They started off, you know, are, are taking uh, jet engines and then making them stationary and then using them to produce electricity. And, uh, and the idea is you have a um, compressor, you have a combustion chamber, and then the, and then the gases go out of the combustion chamber, drive the turbine, and then, um, the, the, and of course, the turbine is generating electrical power. So the ones that are driving jets are usually jet fuel uh, fueled, and uh, and for these for these stationary uh, uh, gas turbines, um, it essentially it's natural gas combustion. So we, they use lean premixed, and that's just that's just to keep the temperature down to keep the NOx low, and um, in the 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 basic design, and this is um, not all all gas turbines are designed this way. But some are designed this way, and, and which is they kind of the combustion is has these cans they're called, and um, and these cans sort of surround the, the periphery of the drive shaft, and then they go into the combustion chamber, which is also uh, around the periphery of the drive shaft. And here's just another example uh, down here. And uh, so there's another one of these cans, and if you like pop open this can and look inside, you'll see something like this. And so each one of these is a burner. And then if we look inside the burner, it looks something like this, and these are swirl vanes. And so the gas uh, will come off of the compressor, the air comes off of the compressor, it's heated, and it's pushed through the swirl vanes, and it's swirled. And then you can see here there's sort of small holes in the swirl vanes, and, um, the, uh, and it, so these are just an example of swirl vanes with holes in them, and they inject fuel. And so then the fuel and the air are mixing in this mixing tube, this mixing section, which is coming out here, and then it dumps into this big, big open area, and you have a stable combustion occurring. And so um, the, the swirl is used to stabilize the flames, and most gas turbines use swirl of, of some sort. Okay, so there's something, um, and in, in actually in this area it's relevant, and in, in that is that this, this work was funded um, for the, because of the interest in clean coal combustion, and that's where you take, um, you know, coal is pretty dirty, you know, fuel, and it produces a lot of uh, uh, CO2, and of course we know that that's, that's bad for the uh, environment. And, um, and so there's, there's a sort of a push, at least until recently, there was, a big, there was a bigger push on this, and the idea is to create clean coal, which is where you gasify the coal, and you turn it into syngas, and syngas is, is hydrogen and CO, and then you would take that, because it has low carbon content, and you would sequester the, the rest of the carbon, and then you would take the, um, the syngas, and you would mix it with natural gas, and then send it into your, and burn it in your gas turbine uh, combustor. And so, the, uh, and so in that way, you have, you know, you're producing uh, a power with much lower uh, a carbon footprint. The, the problem has been, though, the reason that there's, the, and when we started this project, that was a huge interest, the interest has waned a bit, and the reason is because of fracking, that because it's much cheaper now to produce natural gas, and so the price of natural gas has dropped enough that c clean coal is not uh, uh, economically uh, worth it. So it's kind of it's kind of too bad for our research program, um, but um, it's just one of those those realities um, uh, that we have to deal with. So. 
Um, there is a problem though if you, you add the syngas to your, to your natural gas, which is methane, and, um, and that is that hydrogen is an is a energetic fuel and it, and it has kind of fast kinetics, it burns fast, and so there's a tendency for the flame to flash back into the mixing tube. And so um, this is just an example here of where um, the flame flashed back into this mixing section and burned up this, this center body here. And so, and these things are, these are huge power plants and they're worth multi-millions of dollars. And so to have this kind of damage is, is actually is a very, very bad thing. It, it cost, costs you a lot, a lot of money to replace it. So having this flashback is actually a big problem when you want something that is, can handle different fuels. They call, call that fuel uh, flexibility. So we're studying the flashback process, and, and that is how do we understand it, and then potentially how can we uh, potentially use our knowledge to mitigate the occurrence of flashback. So um, flashback then is the unwanted upstream propagation of the flame, and so there's sort of these different modes that, that flashback can, can occur in. Um, so for example, we just have, this would be like a dump combustor, we have a fuel-air premixture, <clears throat> flowing through this tube. They then go into a, a, a dump, you know, a big open area, and it, this flame is stabilized by a recirculation region, and, uh, and so the flame could then potentially just flash back into these, uh, these, these, this reactant stream. There's another way where, and, and this is more common, where you start to add swirl now, maybe not exactly in this way, but, but there are some gas turbines like the Alstrom where you bring in fuel and oxidizer and you're swirling them and as the reason you're bringing them with swirl is they're mixing, but also then, the, then you have, once you go into this dump, you have what's called vortex breakdown and you get these recirculation regions. And so this makes the flame very stable because it's taking hot products and it's bringing them down into the reactant streams and then, and then just creating, creating a very stable, uh, stable flame. So, um, but what can happen is you add the hydrogen to the fuel, it then increases the flame speed and it can flash back into this tube. And the way it does it is like this, here's the flame is, is here, this is a luminosity image, actually a movie sequence, and the flame then is, is flashing back. And you'll see it's sort of flashing back to the center, to the core of that, of that vortex, of that swirling vortex. So it just, it just it propagates down the middle. So um, this is one mode of flashback. This is not actually the mode that we are studying. We are studying this configuration, and that's where you bring the uh, fuel and air uh, through these swirl veins, and the flow is swirled around this center body, and then it, again, it dumps into this, this larger uh, combustion uh, section. You, you also have vortex breakdown, you have re recirculation, but now when it flashes back, it flashes back along this center body. And so what happens, it's sort of an interesting uh, process because now the flame is interacting with the boundary layer on the center body. So this is called boundary layer flashback. And this is just a direct numerical simulation. This is a flame, and uh, this is a, in a, actually a turbulent channel flow, and this is just showing how the flame is interacting with that oncoming flow. So I'm gonna discuss this more later. Okay, some more sort of basic stuff. This is your combustion uh, 101. Um, you have a, let's just take, this is just static fuel plus air premixture, and then you um, light it on the one end, okay? And then you, let's just say, you, you light it in a way that the flame is, is sort of cleaner, and then that flame is going to propagate um, because it's going to want to burn in this premixed reactants, and it's going to move to the left. And it's going to move at some speed, let's call it SL, that's, that's usually uh, given for the laminar flame speed. Behind the flame is these burnt gases or these product gases, mainly, you know, CO2 and, and H2O. And uh, in, the, in the upstream of it is, are the unburned uh, reactants. So what happens then if we um, have, this, have a flow, a bulk flow, that's going left to right, and then we do the same uh, way we light the flame, and then that, that flame wants to sort of propagate to the left, and whether it can or not will depend on the relative speeds between U and SL. And so if um, SL is less than U, then the flame will propagate to the right. And essentially will just blow out of the tube. And so that's called uh, blow off or blow out. And, uh, and if, if the incoming bulk velocity is lower than the flame speed, then it's going, the flame speed is larger, it's gonna overcome this lower velocity, it's gonna propagate to the left. And so that is what we call flashback. So 
Flashback is occurring then when the, the, that bulk flow is, is moving slow enough that this flame can propagate upstream. So there's a few twists on this, that if the, the, if the flow is uh, turbulent, let's say these reactants are turbulent, it's going to wrinkle the flame, and um, essentially you have this kind of greater surface area for, for combustion to occur. You have higher reaction rates, higher heat release, and uh, you end up having a higher uh, flame speed. So this, this is ST is turbulent, flame speed is greater than the laminar flame speed. All right, a, a few more uh, twists. So in reality, the flow that comes in will have some velocity profile. So this might be, this is a channel flow, so some kind of a channel flow profile. Maybe it's turbulent, it has a very sharp gradient, uh, perhaps. But we're going to now light it um, on this one end. And then what is that flame going to do? It initially starts out, we're going to light it in some magical way where we make it planar. And then it's going to propagate. And so the, of course, it's going to, at the, at the walls, it's going against flow that's very slow velocity. So it's going to be able to go faster in the lab frame uh, at the walls than it is in the center. And, uh, and so what's going to happen is that the, it's going to propagate something like this. Um, where the, uh, the, the flame speed at the walls is going to, going to kind of lead that at the center line. So it's going to get this sort of curved shape, a V-shape or a U-shape. And, um, and if we kind of go look right at what's happening at the wall, then, and, and you go, well, the flame goes all the way to the wall, and it, in, in fact, it, it doesn't quite uh, uh, do that. But if it did, because the velocity is zero at the wall, because of the no-slip condition, then that flame should propagate at the laminar flame speed. All right, so what is it um, sort of really, what really happens is the flame, if it was touching the wall, the flame is really hot, you'd have heat transfer to the wall, and it would essentially quench the frame, flame, right? It'd be too cold to burn. You would remove all the radicals, so the, it would, the radicals would combine at the wall. And uh, so that's called quenching. And so the, essentially the flame doesn't exist a distance of delta Q away from the wall. And, uh, and, and so that's called the quenching distance. And so um, in the um, in, in 40s, this is how far back this goes, uh, Lewis and Van Elbe, they uh, came up with a uh, criterion for flashback. And this is actually intuitive, like, like a really nice intuitive way to think about flashback. It turns out it's wrong, but it's really a good way to think about it. <laughs> and I, um, so, <clears throat> and that is, you will have flashback because remember, it's going to flash back the most at the walls where the velocity is the lowest. And you'll get flashback if the flame speed at the quenching distance, which is this height, is greater than that oncoming velocity, right? Intuitively, that makes um, a lot of sense. So um, now, one reason that's not quite right is that when you have heat transfer away from the flame, the, the chem flame chemistry slows down, the kinetics slow down, so the flame actually curves for one, and so that's, that's one um, um, twist. And there is another uh, uh, bigger difference, actually. Um, and, this is, and we can see that from looking at this. This is a direct numerical simulation of turbulence, and this was by um, Andrea Gruber uh, at Centif and uh, Jackie Chen. And so this is a, uh, a direct numerical simulation of turbulence. This is a channel flow. This is, so it's a turbulent channel flow. It's propagating left to right. And then they did that kind of thing where they lit it numerically on the right, creating a planar flame. It then uh, created, this is, I know it's a little hard to see, but there's sort of this V shape here. That's that C shape or U shape that I showed earlier. It's propagating faster at the top and bottom walls. And you'll kind of see these, these sort of um, bulgy things here, these kind of tongues. And, um, and the, they tend to occur in regions of lower incoming velocity. And then if you zoom in on that, like right at the wall, it looks like this. So this is what the flame looks like as it approaches the wall. It's curved like I was showing. <clears throat> but, and then the flow is, is coming into the flame, but you'll see it's deflecting around the flame. And then right in front of that flame tip, it's actually moving, the vectors are moving in this direction. And so, what's, and so it's sort of like the flame is a piston and it's pushing the flow out of the way. And then the, and, and, and the reason is, is there's dilatation that the flame is a source of volume. It's a, the, 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 there's, there's, you know, there's del dot u, right? The positive dilatation, the flow is expanding out, and then the, it has to go somewhere, and it's, it, and it's expanding out and pushing the flow out in front of it. 
So also the flow has to deflect around the flame. So it's sort of like the flame, it's not solid. It's sort of like it's a porous cylinder, or sorry, a porous piston that's pushing, um, pushing the, the flow out of the way. But the reason this is important is if you're a flame, would you rather be propagating like you're, you know, into a flow that's coming in, you know, in this direction? Or would you rather be propagating against the flow that's coming this direction, right? If it's going this direction, it's going to be much easier, right? It's just because the flow's already going in that direction. It doesn't have to push it. It's just move, move, already moving. And so the flame is then, by this porous piston effect, is helping its own propagation, right? And so it's a very, very different process than the Lewis and Van Elby uh, model, where the flame is just superimposed on the flow. It's not sort of affecting the flow. This is saying the flame fundamentally affects its own propagation. It is changing the flow structure in a way that, that, that actually helps its flame propagation, its own propagation. All right, so this is just another example of that. And, uh, and, uh, um, and then the, the, what's interesting is like, it seems like a lot of things now, like some of these fundamental physics things are now coming out of simulation, uh, direct numerical simulations. This was a case where it actually, this, this um, observation of this negative, um, uh, this region of reverse flow actually came out of a PIV measurement of a flashback measurement by Saddle Myers group um, earlier than the, than the DNS. So that was, that's good to see, that can still happen. And, um, and so, um, so this was just essentially a similar kind of configuration, and that's what, I know it's, it's hard to see, but this is the flame here, and they're just showing in front of the flame is this negative uh, velocity region. And then um, this is another study, and this is from a swirling flame, where this is a flame, and, it's, and this is a center body here, and it's propagating, swirling around, downwards, and then, and, and this, is, this is also from Saddle Myers Group and uh, Dreitzler at um, Darmstadt. And, but they, they show this little region here, which is a negative axial velocity region. So <clears throat> what everyone is showing is when the flame flashes back along a boundary layer, it does so in a way that there's always this negative, veloc a negative velocity region in front of it. And so people say, therefore, to have flashback, you must have reverse flow. In, in, front, in front of the flame, that it'll always induce in, uh, reverse flow in order to propagate it. Some people say it's separated flow, and, and sometimes it's just uh, stated as being reverse flow. But we'll, we'll be looking at that in the case of our uh, swirling flows. Okay, so let's get to our current work. So this is our model swirl combustor. Um, it, it basically is a um, glass tube. There's swirl vanes in it. There's a center body here. Uh, well, the center body is, is here, and then there's a combustion section here. And so the, um, we have premixed reactants that we bring in down below. They then are, are mixed already, and this is, let's just say it's a, uh, maybe it's methane and air mixture. They go through the swirl veins, and they swirl around this center body. They then go into this dump here, and then they, you have vortex breakdown and a nice stable flame. So the swirl number here is 0.9. And then the, I, have, I show holes here in these swirl veins, but for this study that I'm going to show you now, we're not using them. We do use these when we're trying to create stratified mixtures. That means variable equivalence ratio to sort of affect flashback, but I'm not going to show you those, those results. This is what it looks like. Actually, it looked like this for about an hour when we first um, uh, put this thing together, and then we start burning, and then it gets all tarnished and ugly. Um, but uh, that, that is what it looked like at, at one time. And so this is the, the swirl vein here, and this is a quartz tube. And then the cent center body is stainless steel. So that's just what it looks like in the lab, that there's I mean, lasers and cameras around it. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna show you is just atmospheric pressure. We've also done work at pressure, and I'll show you uh, one, one slide of those uh, results um, at elevated pressure, I should say. Um, so we're looking at fully premixed, um, methane, methane air, and methane hydrogen air mixtures. And we're not really distinguishing between if we add a little bit of hydrogen or even a lot of hydrogen, it doesn't actually change the physics very much, so we're not, I'm not going to dwell on, on those differences. Um, so I'm going to show you now, which is, this is the basic uh, configuration, and then um, I'm going to uh, show you where we're going to create a stable flame 
Here at a low equivalence ratio, the equivalence ratio will be 0.6. And then the flame is sort of dim. And then <coughs> we want to create flashback. So we create flashback by raising the equivalence ratio. In a sense, just adding more fuel to the, to the premixture. And so the flame, the chemistry becomes more intense, or the kinetics are faster, flame speed's higher, and when it goes to a higher equivalence ratio, it also gets brighter to your eye, so you'll see that, and then it's going to flash back down into this uh, tube. So this is just going to um, show you what it looks like. So there's, this is a, a stable flame, an equivalence ratio of 0.6, then you're going to see it get brighter. That's because we added more fuel and we got, brought it to an equivalence ratio of 0.9. That is high enough for it to flash back. And we do that with, with uh, program mass flow controllers. It's done sort of fast in terms of changing the equivalence ratio. And um, there's sound, but so it goes, okay, so that's just sort of what it looks like. That's kind of a real time. That's what your eye would see. Now I slowed it down and you see that it's, it's then, um, flashes back, it just sort of hugs the uh, center body. Um, and I'll just, okay, it's going to go again. So it's, it's, it's low equivalence ratio, we raise it and then it flashes back. And it just hugs, and it just hugs that center body, uh, showing it again in uh, slow-mo. It kind of just goes right, right down. All right, so then, um, so this is what it looks like. So that was sort of real time, which your eye would see. This is what it looks like with high-speed imaging. So this is two kilohertz uh, imaging. So this is the stable flame. Ooh, I don't know why it's jumping. So, um, and now it's, it swirls around and you'll, <laughs> I, yeah, that's really strange. I don't know why it's doing that. It's not supposed to be so jumpy. Um, and um, so it, really weird. So you kind of look at it, so they see these tongues, and these kind of tongues of flame sort of lead, and then they, they rotate around. And, and I, I say that because some people say, why doesn't it just go straight down, right? Or just like, why does it have any structure as a muthily at all around that cylinder? Why doesn't it just rotate and just all, go all the way down? And I will um, make the point about why that is uh, later. But so, so it, it, it sort of propagates by these tongues that then, then lead that, that flashback process. So this is just an example. This is like a shorter sequence showing these flame tongues as it's, as it's rotating around. And these things have a nice ethereal kind of quality to them. <laughs> and, uh, but these, these, so the, the flashback is led by these tongues. It's not happening uniformly. And so we're going to use that in terms of interpreting um, our, our data later on. All right, so um, we, we also have this high pressure combustor, and I, I'm not going to spend much time on this. I just want to make the point that, so we're, we're spending, uh, like we're doing all these studies on these one atmosphere cases that are kind of low Reynolds number. And, um, and, and so we also did work in, in, in the high pressure combustor, which lets us go to significantly higher Reynolds numbers at the same uh, volume flow rate. So this is just a comparison of a one atmosphere case and a four atmosphere case. So it's four times higher um, Reynolds number on the right than on the left. And you do see it looks more turbulent in the, um, in the uh, higher pressure case. The, the flashback is actually a little slower than, um, than, than in, the, the, um, in the lower uh, pressure case. And that's because the kinetics are actually slower. That, that's one well-known effect of, of pressure is to <coughs> re reduce the chemical kinetics. And so, um, the, but, but it's also turbulent, so you'd think that could make up for it in terms of the higher flame speed. But basically, the, 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 the behavior of the flame, yes, it's more wrinkled in its appearance, but it, it actually behaves kind of the same way. It has these tongues that propagate down. They're leading, leading the flashback process along the boundary layer. So it's just sort of showing you that, it, that what we're learning about the flashback in, the, in this lower Reynolds number case isn't totally irrelevant to flashback at a higher Reynolds number case. All right, so um, I'm going to show now a series of um, high-speed uh, PIV uh, data. And so we use 
um, high speed PIV, so that's particle image velocimetry to get the velocity field, and this is high speed stereo PIV, so we have two cameras that let us get the, the, the PIV, and the laser is being brought down from the top down, and we don't bring it in from the side and hit the center body, just because there's so much flash of the laser, you know, the glare from the laser that it, you know, we can't make a measurement close to the, to the surface of the, of the cylinder, so we bring it in from the top, and it just sort of grazes the, the, the surface. And then, sim and then we simultaneously measure with an intensified high-speed camera the flame luminosity, all right? And you'll see why that's important. And those, those images that I, movies I've been showing you are of flame luminosity. So the, the framing rate with these is four kilohertz. And so we're measuring three components of velocity in a plane with the PIV. So this is now just non-reacting. There's no flame here. So we're, we're, down, we're at the exit of the mixing tube. And this is what a velocity field looks like. And there's sort of this region here um, near the center body that is, uh, this is negative velocity inside this white line. It's, posi it, it's, uh, it's positive outside, so positive is up. And, um, and so what I want you to look for is sort of the presence that this thing is going to come and go. Um, this kind of, this is, this is a region of separation and it kind of comes, go go, comes and goes in time. And then also <coughs> you're looking for sort of what's happening in the outer flow and how it interacts with that. So this is just, uh, so there's, here's this separated flow that kind of, it, it pokes its head down and then it, it sort of goes away. And so what's happening there is there's what's, what's well known uh, precessing vortex core that is, is sitting there moving around and it creates a sort of intermittent, or actually not intermittent, periodic uh, separation that sort of pushes down into this, in this flow. <coughs> and this is how, how the flashback actually starts, right? The flashback wants to propagate against low velocity fluid. So when it, when it separates like that, the, fla it's, the flame loves it and it wants to propagate right down there. So that's why it starts with those tongues, that's how those tongues start, and then they just continue propagating uh, down. Okay, so we, um, we can actually use the particles, and look, this is a um, particle movie, and it's, um, It sort of has that weird flashing thing, but um, so this is just a particle movie, and so you can see when the flame comes down because the, there's actually no particles there anymore because we use an aerosol and or mineral oil particles that evaporate in the presence of the flame, and so we actually use that to to let us tell us where the flame is, and so we do it. We just we do some um, um, contrast enhancement, <coughs> we binarize the image do some low pass filtering, and then we detect the edge. And so this essentially gives us our uh, flame and uh, flame front. And so when we can use that um, information, and, uh, and we're gonna use it to, in order to, um, um, to mark where the flame front is in the high speed uh, PIV data. Okay, so um, you're gonna see the flame now is here and it's pushing down, and you kind of see this white line is a zero velocity line, and inside it, it's actually negative axial velocity. So remember that we saw all those studies that showed if you had flashback occurring, there was that region of negative axial velocity where the flame is pushing the flow out of the way. We see the same thing. You see it's, the flame is receding now, it's going back upstream, and you don't see that. And so it is true, when it's moving downstream, there's a negative axial velocity region. When it moves downstream, it's not there. Right. So the other thing to notice is, like, look at the response of the outer flow, this incoming flow, to the flame. See, the flame comes down, and the flow is pushed out of the way. These lines, streamlines are deflected because the flame presents a lot of blockage to the flow. So this, the, the, the flame is participating, you know, substantially in its own propagation. Um, in, in pushing, the flow has to move around it because it sees all this volumetric expansion as blockage. So the flow has to adjust um, as it's moving up through that mixing tube, it has to adjust to the presence of that flame. So it's actually a very complex coupled uh, system to understand. Okay, so this is a case where the flame just came down and it went back up. It didn't flash back all the way. Most of what I'm gonna show you now is where the flame uh, completely flashes back. All right, so let's, let's look more at, at some of these uh, uh, movies and um, uh, sequences, I should say. 
And um, so here's a case, and we first started taking the data, and we, we would show, well, here's the flame, there's no flame. The flame kind of pokes its head down here, it, it moves farther along the center body, moves farther, and you can, you know, um, look and say it moved this distance in this time, therefore its flame velocity is this, right? And, um, and we can see how fast the flame is propagating. And, um, and, the, and the problem with that is this, when the, you then image with the luminosity camera, which actually tell the, the luminosity cameras tell us, tell us where the flame actually is, then in this frame, so this was done simultaneously, so this is the sort of the side view, like from this view on the side, the camera is looking sort of straight on, our edge on, so this is the laser sheet here. So we don't see any flame here because the flame is behind the center body. And then the flame is rotating around <coughs> and it just cuts through the top, this part cuts through the top of the laser sheet, so you see the flame right there. It then rotates around further, it's halfway down, and you see it move down to here. It then rotates all the way uh, or, or farther around. So now the true bottom of the flame is crossing the laser sheet, and it's only then that we can actually say that, well, this is, this is really what that, that flame tip looks like. So we were misinterpreting this as the flame tip. So, and, and the, okay, so what I'm saying is this. The flame is not moving downstream. It is simply rotating around without moving downstream. We are, if, you, if you don't have this information, you, and you only have the planar information, you're gonna really misinterpret what's happening, right? So this requires like, like uh, uh, Professor Ma's developing 3D technique. This is why you need the 3D techniques to, to, to um, um, get at these kinds of effects. Okay, so um, the, the, this is just to show these pockets of um, negative axial velocity. So as the flame is propagating down, you see that, that you know, it, it does create these pockets of negative axial velocity as, as um, other people had uh, shown. And, and, and the question is, does that, is that separating the flow? What's, what's really happening in turn that? But, but it does appear that <coughs> you need that in order to have flashback occur because you don't see it when it, it moves downstream. All right, so we, we've done a lot of um, work with more three-dimensional techniques also, and it's like the flow is three-dimensional, and it really needs you know, more information that you can get with the planar case. The planar case is, can be highly misleading. So we use um, tomographic PIV, and in tomographic PIV, you use multiple cameras. In this case, we're using uh, four cameras. And uh, essentially, from these, the information from these four different views, you're able to determine where a particle is in three-dimensional space, right? You, you do it only over a fairly small region, which is you kind of like it's a thick laser sheet here. And, um, and so it's not a huge volume. It's like a, 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 you know, a few millimeters or so. And I mean, at least in, in what we're doing here, based on our limited uh, laser power. So, um, and, and one thing to keep in mind is that the laser sheet is just kind of tangen crossing tangential to, the, to that cylinder. It can't wrap around the cylinder, so when you're making a three-dimensional measurement, it's of this kind of uh, extended volume that is tangent, you know, sort of just tangent to the uh, cylinder. And so, um, and, and one thing that we realized is that the way we extract that flame surface from the two d planar images that we thought maybe we can do that in, in three dimensions, right? And we can actually get a three-dimensional flame surface. And this was new at the, at the time, and um, other people have done this since, since that, that time we first uh, did this. Um, but so you have these views for the, the uh, uh, four cameras, and, um, and, and uh, you just, we just do some contrast uh, enhancement, and then we do a three-dimensional reconstruction. And um, this is now, um, actually planes of particles <coughs> that have been reconstructed in three-dimensional space. Um, and so there's, a, there's basically this, this uh, volume, and we're just stepping through different planes and showing you what the particles look like in the different planes. So when we first did it, what we saw is, hey, there's no, there, you know, there, there's no, uh, the flame, we can see where the flame is, so maybe we can then um, um, connect the, you know, essentially get the interface between the particles and no particles, get the flame front, and then, and now we have a, a three-dimensional flame front. And so, 
the, oh, well, I'm going to skip that. So this is the result of that. This is the, th the, the reconstructed 3D rendered um, uh, flame front. And it kind of looks like a flame, you know, that's, that looks uh, uh, pretty good. And, um, but of course, you know, that, that may just be a coincidence. And so um, one thing we did is we just um, um, did some validation of this technique. And so we um, took, some, took some luminosity data at the same time um, as we're, we're showing the simultaneous th three-dimensional velocity data. And so the flame is crossing, um, you know, into this field of view where the PIV is. And then you'll see that the flame, the rendered flame shows up here. Now you'll, you'll if I, um, so we take something like this and you'll see that the flame is here and that looks um, kind of similar to this one, but it's not showing this one over here, right? This part of the flame. And you go, why isn't it there? The reason it's not there is because from this view, this is a top view, the laser sheet is tangential to that, um, to that cylinder the flame is wrapped around the cylinder. And so the luminosity will show you this part here is right here in the, in the laser sheet, but this part here is wrapped around the cylinder and is actually far away from the laser sheet. So it's not actually cutting through the laser sheet. So then you'll see more structures come through. So that's one thing is that you have to sort of be careful in how you interpret, it, interpret even this three-dimensional data because the three di this laser sheet doesn't wrap around the, the uh, cylinder. But it's looking actually pretty good. It looks pretty close to what we're seeing in, in, the, um, in the luminosity. Um, and, and one thing that's kind of interesting is, is you see these negative axial velocity regions here. And we actually have the full three-dimensional uh, vector field. So we can actually say what's going on. And, and I'll have more to say about that in a second. OK, so we did some validation of this. And, um, and so we wanted to see. How does the three-dimensionally rendered uh, flame surface compare to the two-dimensional flame surfaces that we could capture with thin, sh thin laser sheets? <clears throat> and so we did simultaneous thick sheet, tomographic PIV, and thin sheet, um, it's kind of standard 2D uh, PIV. Um, and in order to get a two-dimensional uh, two flame front um, flame surface and simultaneous with the three-dimensional. OK, so and then we do that with two different uh, planes. So this is just an example. And so, the, the, so this is just the three different examples. And um, so the, the um, three-dimensional case is in yellow. The two-dimensional case is in green. And you see that like, in the, there's a case where they agree quite well. And, um, and I have error bars on the uh, two-dimensional case. And then you kind of see where they stop agreeing is largely where the uncertainty in the, in the two-dimensional case is actually high. And that's just because the gradient in the particle fields become weak. It becomes hard to say where the flame is, or there's big uncertainty in saying where the flame is. And that's also where the three-dimensional reconstruction has problem, right? So it's, it's actually kind of logical that, that that would be uh, the case. Where it's unambiguous, it's unambiguous for both. And then they agree uh, very well. So take an example here. These ones on this side agree very well. On this side, they don't agree, and they don't agree when the uncertainty in the 2D case uh, is, is high. So what, what it's saying is basically that the, the three-dimensional reconstruction does about as good as the 2D. So if you believe the 2D, you're OK with believing the 3D. Um, and, they, and they shouldn't be believed in all cases. Turns out you don't actually know when you can't trust it, but you know, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> um, OK, so let's just look at now some of the, the um, some results. And this is of the, uh, this is the three-dimensional case. And um, <coughs> so the flame is, is now just kind of uh, poking through. And now you see that you can see the incoming um, swirling streamlines. And then the flame is coming in. And you, it's really nice in that you see how it responds, how the flow responds to the presence of that uh, a flame front. As it as it um, as it propagates downstream, and you can see the deflection, the motion of these of these um, incoming uh, velocity vectors uh, due to the presence of that flame. So one thing that we realized, 
and this was actually quite um, interesting, is that, um, so this is a, a still of a three-dimensional uh, three rendering. And so this is, here is this region of negative axial velocity, this blue. And when we actually looked at the streamlines, so, <coughs> so people say the flow is reversed, right? It has reversed flow. It's actually not reversed flow, because reversed flow would mean the oncoming uh, streamlines are actually in this direction. So that would mean the flame would move, be propagating down, and it would turn the, the streamlines back on themselves. So it should go this direction if the flow is actually uh, reversed. Instead, the flow is simply deflected, right? So in the, the channel flow cases that I showed you, the DNS, they were literally reversed. In the, in the, in the swirling case, they're not reversed, they're simply deflected. They're, sub, so they're deflected a lot, no question, and they're deflected enough that you have a negative axial velocity, but you never get full reversal, okay? So, and so we think that, that and this is just a result of the three-dimensional relieving effect. You, you probably learn, learn about that in, in classes, that, and that is the extra three, you know, the third dimension gives a flow, an extra dimension to flow into. So effectively, the flame looks like less of a blockage to the flow. And so it's not completely reversing it. But it also says that the, the swirling case should actually um, um, have a little harder time propagating, you know, because it's not able to completely reverse the flow like in the 2D channel case. Okay, I'm skipping that. All right, we've done some more 3D work. And, um, and so I would just say that the Tomo um, technique gives us a lot of um, really nice uh, information. Um, and, uh, and my students, though, they, they actually were thinking about it and just actually came up with a really cool idea and the way to use our data. And uh, that kind of led to this whole, whole other thing. So, um, so, and I kept mentioning that, that, that the laser sheet comes in, it's tangent to the, the cylinder. <clears throat> and so that always kind of created problems for us in how we're interpreting what's going on. And so can we do better than that? And, um, and so what the student said is, well, um, what we notice is that those flame tongues, as they're propagating um, kind of in front of that cylinder, they kind of look the same, right? That the shape of the, of the flame tongue doesn't actually change very much in time. And so um, that, that you essentially, that the, it's like that the flow is frozen while, the, while that flame tongue is um, propagating. And so the, the, flame, the flame retains its shape as it propagates. And so what we assume is this just means that the flow structure that the flame is encountering is kind of constant in time. So, <clears throat> so when it's sort of on the left of the cylinder, it has this kind of flow structure, and then it moves down. And it's, even though it's a different spatial location, the flow coming in kind of looks the same. And if that weren't the case, you would say the flame shape would change, right? So it's, just a, it's, a, it's an assumption that we're, that we're, make, we're making. And uh, what that lets you do is do a uh, time space, use a time space equivalence principle. And this is like similar to if you're familiar with what Taylor's hypothesis is. It's like Taylor's hypothesis for a rotating flow or a swirling flow. So the idea is this. We have a laser sheet that's fixed in space. And then we have a flame tongue that propagates in time. And it cuts through different, so at different times you're cutting through different parts of that flame tongue. Well, if the flame shape stays the same and the flow structure stays the same, that's equivalent to having a stationary flame tongue and you just chop it like this, like it's frozen in space and you just chop it and you look at different cross sections of it. Now, you have to think about how you chop it because you have to translate your laser sheet by these convection distances and we, we get that. We know the from the, the uh, luminescence imaging, we, we know what the velocity of the tip is in the, and the angular velocity of the tip. So we're able to use space-time equivalence to reconstruct, in a sense, the three-dimensional velocity field around the cylinder. All right. So this is just an example. And um, of, this is a, a, a particle field. And this is a flame that's coming down through the, down through the particle field. And this is a flame surface that is reconstructed based on this uh, space-time equivalence principle. And um, so, this, so it's like taking, you're taking this moving thing 
and you're turning it into a static sort of snapshot, but the snapshot is of the three-dimensional structure okay, of the flame. So, and this is now just an example of it. So this is the luminosity image. And then we said, well, let's, we reconstructed the three-dimensional uh, flame. And this is, of course, wrapped around the cylinder now. This is fully three-dimensional. And then uh, we, did a pr we projected it um, onto the camera, essentially onto the camera, to make it kind of look like the luminosity. And you see they actually look remarkably similar. You even capture these streaks here, these kind of striations that are, that are in the flame. And remember, this is luminosity. This is from particles only, right? So it's pretty amazing um, the, the, uh, how, how uh, similar that works. Okay, so this is now the three-dimensionally reconstructed uh, flame surface. And, and then this down here is that region of negative axial velocity. So this was really, for us, is a very powerful thing because before we were just saying, well, we could only comment on the right of the flame tip, just at the very base here, that you can see this negative axial region. But now we see that, oh, it's actually extended. It's like this flame is propagating in this direction, swirling around, propagating here. And then this whole leading edge of the flame is actually pushing the flow out and is creating that negative um, axial uh, velocity region. So it's, it's actually much bigger region is, is it, it's, it's sort of this blockage effect of the flame. It occurs over much bigger region than we thought uh, previously. And so the, um, I'm almost done. Um, the, uh, uh, we, one thing we can do is, um, you can do a lot with the data, and one thing you can do is uh, change the frame of reference. Okay, so now, um, so what, this one here is in the lab frame of reference. And then we can say, let's get in the flame of, frame of reference of the flame and see what the flow looks like. Well, in that case, the, now the, the, um, so in the lab frame of reference, the flow is swirling this way, so the, the streamlines are this way. In the flame, frame of reference of the, um, of the flame, that the streamlines are actually coming right, right at it like this. And, and I'll just say that the reason that these incoming streamlines are at an angle is that because the flame is, is rotating faster than the swirl, the, the, the swirl of uh, angular velocity. And, uh, and so if, it, if they were the same, if the flame was just simply following the, the, the swirl motion, then uh, these would be just straight up. Okay, so now I'm gonna take that three-dimensionally rendered flame surface, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hatch it just so you can see through it. And then this is the incoming flow. And um, this is now a movie. And so we can actually look at the kinematics. So this is pretty cool. And this is all my students came up with this that I, I, I actually probably didn't, um, they just like uh, told me about this. And, and I was like, wow, that's really cool. Uh, so um, this is a particle. And then um, the, um, we're gonna see that particle is how it's gonna convect um, along with the flow. This is just uh, kinematics. And so, and you're going to look at it here, and it's going to then go into the flame. It kind of slows down, and then it speeds up. So it's, it's moving upstream, moving constant velocity. It slows down right when it gets near the flame, and then it speeds up right at, you know, as it passes the flame. And if we look at, <clears throat> in the top view, so it looks like the, the particle's in the flame. It's not in the flame. It's just underneath here, right? So it's, it's still not in, when it starts out. It doesn't hit the flame till now. And so you see, it, 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 uh, it's constant velocity, it gets near the flame, it slows down, but then it bends out, and then it bends back down. Okay, and so the students notice this, and they're like, and they're looking in the, in the numerical simulations, and they weren't seeing that effect. So they're like, why is it doing that? Or is there something wrong with our method, or something like that? So then they, I said, well, look at other cases, and so they, um, they did that, they put a bunch of streamlines in and they, and they did, took other data and it looks similar. And that is that the, the streamlines, <clears throat> so there's some streamlines that are below the flame, there's the ones that they look like they're not affected at all. Um, but for a lot of these ones are here, are the flame or the streamlines are deflected outwards and then they move back towards the cylinder. So radially out and then move back towards the cylinder. So, and, and so this is a very systematic effect. And we realized that it had to do with 
um, fictitious forces that are sort of causing these uh, kinematics to occur. So just for example, <clears throat> imagine you had a particle and it's simply rotating around this at angular velocity omega naught, and then and then uh, and a uh, and then it has that that uh, the, the actual angular velocity omega naught uh, r, uh, the the rotation rates omega naught, and uh, in that case in the lab frame that this particle is constantly accelerating, and that acceleration is is due to this uh, pressure gradient, right? Is that your f equals m a? However, if you start rotating with the particle, so your frame of reference is going to rotate with the particle, and you're, you could think of it as you're on the particle, and you don't know you're accelerating. And so you, there's, you, there is, you, you feel the pressure force, but what you feel is a centrifugal force that's push, trying to throw you, throw you, uh, you know, push you uh, radially away. But that's a fictitious force. We know because it's, you're actually con continuously accelerating inwards. So, that's the case when you're moving with the main flow, with the particle. In the case of the flame reference frame, we're actually not at the flow, or I'd say in the, in the reference frame of the particle, we're the reference frame of the flame. And the flame rotation rate is different from that of the, of the particle. So in that case, you get another fictitious force, which is the Coriolis force. So the, the uh, Coriolis force here, then, is related to the, the, um, the rotation rate of the flame and that particle velocity. So now where that particle accelerates, it actually changes the, the Coriolis force. So, the, um, so this is the situation that we have, where we, we, these fluid particles are feeling two fictitious forces, centrifugal force and the Coriolis force. So this is just an, a, a movie uh, showing that, oops. Um, there's sort, of, there's sort of this balance of forces depending on where the particle is. And since we actually have the equation of motion, we have all the velocities, we can actually compute them, right? So we can compute centrifugal and Coriolis forces. We cannot compute the pressure gradient, and we cannot compute the viscous uh, forces. So um, just to show you that, so this is what the speed looks like along, the, along this particle path, which is also a streamline. And so the, basically the speed is fairly constant until the particle approaches the flame. The speed decreases. We saw that it slowed down. And then it's, it's speeded up. And then it, so as it passes, passes the flame. Of course, it's speeding up because of the, 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 the massive flow expansion. That has the effect of the centrifugal force is sort of constant. But then the, as the particle approaches the flame, that the, the Coriolis force decreases because the particle velocity decreases. And the, of course, the Coriolis force is trying to force it in radially inward. So then that, that's why the particle then moves outwards all of a sudden. And then the flow, but then the particle accelerates, increases the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force pushes the flow back inwards, all right, but towards, the, towards the cylinder. So it turns out this is a very different behavior than you see with the two-dimensional case that we see in the DNS where you have all the information, you can compute all this stuff, and you see it's actually fundamentally different. So you have this sort of collapse of streamlines towards the center body um, due to these Coriolis forces, and, um, and so what that has the effect of should be reducing the blockage of the flame. So the blockage affects the ability for the flame to propagate or to flash back, and it's fundamentally changing that due to these fictitious forces. So this is not something that people had recognized uh, previously. Okay, so this is the, my uh, conclusion then. So um, we studied flame flow interaction um, with, uh, you know, during flashback using those planar and tomographic methods. Um, we, we looked at these sort of different methods for reconstructing the three-dimensional flame surface. And we did see, in agreement with other work, that you always see this region of negative axial velocity during flashback. But we, we came up with a different um, observation that is, in the swirling case, that the, the flow, flow is not actually reversed. It is simple, the streamlines are simply deflected um, due to the blockage of, that, of the flame. And then the, uh, um, the, the swirling flame flow interaction, we analyzed with this, in this inertial reference frame. And we showed the importance of these fictitious forces and understanding the particle kinematics. And uh, of course, that is fundamental to the understanding the flame flow interaction, which is important for understanding the physics of flame propagation. And so uh, we think that the Coriolis force then is, reduced, is leading to this, this, um, this, this movement of the streamlines towards the cylinder and thus reducing the overall blockage to the flow. 
And so that is all I have. So I'll take your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Noah. Yeah. I didn't know really much about surface and interactions between the planes. It's really great to bring us through all that. I was curious that with this much more detailed and careful understanding about what happens with the planes to flash plants, does that suggest that we may want to do something different to the surface in terms of maybe applying BGs or even unsteady um, phenomena closer to the surface to help either prevent that flashback or maybe to enhance it, take advantage of that So yeah, so I, I would say that the answer is yes, and I don't know like all the different things that you might do. And I, I and so there there are other things like um, this is relatively new and so we haven't sort of thought about that that much. There are like people do things like they want to inject um, like leaner mixtures you know, closer to the surface to, to reduce the propensity flashback along that, that the, um, the wall. Um, maybe you want to increase the velocity gradient near the wall to reduce flashback, right? So there's sort of things that are um, obvious that you would want to do anyway. And in terms of this, this um, particular effect, um, I'm not sure, like, because yes, that how, so, so the question would be, how could you um, counteract the Coriolis force? Or, or something, the, or, or actually enhance the Coriolis force because the Coriolis force is reducing the blockage, which means the flow is, feels more uninhibited by the flame, so it actually is less likely to flash back. So it's actually sort of helping, you know, you reduce flashback in that sense. So, but, um, so maybe if some idea of suction and blowing or something, you could then, yeah, you kind of get the effect that you want. Yeah. I have one. It's beautiful data. I've never seen that much nice result data. Uh, tomographic PID and luminosity all together. I'm wondering, and I'm sure you, you have algorithms to correct for the diffraction by the curve towards two, how that plays into the spatial resolution of the PID. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that kind of comes out of the calibration process and sort of how well you can, you can calibrate. And so we do notice a degradation due to the curvature. And so we, we, um, we went to a higher quality glass. And so as long as it's systematic, you're okay. You know, like if it's completely repeatable every time. But so we, we went to uh, a higher optical quality uh, glass and a thinner wall tube. And that could reduce it to, you know, very, very manageable levels. But the uncertainties are worse um, and because you're having to look through the curved glass. And you can see that in the, in the calibration process. So where you're putting a grid in there, which you know is, you know, so you know what it's supposed to look like, right? Be, um, and then you're trying to reconstruct that. So you can see how far off you are. Right, right, yeah. It sort of, it sort of at least it tells you how well you're doing. Mm -hmm. But it works quite well, you know, so it, it is actually quite good data. You want one student question? <laughs> so, in, in some kind of system where, where you'd uh, have a uh, flame in industry and you're worried about a uh, flat back like this, um, I wonder if you could use maybe not PIV, but um, the kind of luminescent <coughs> imaging right. to monitor. Conditions and to avoid flashback and to create it. Right. Do you think that's possible? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's actually that they are working on that kind of thing now. They have they have limited optical access, so there's like research grade um, combustors and things where they they actually do that kind of thing. So yeah, absolutely. And that's where you can you know you're you're um, detecting it, and then they could inject something else in to maybe try to quench the flame or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's a good question. Questions? Last call. 
<laughs> okay. Thank you.